Hey guys, what's up? I'm Noah, this is Analog Resurgence, and today I'm gonna to be talking about how ISO works when you're shooting film. There are a lot of factors that come into play when you're shooting film and determining your exposure. And it's very much a different experience than when you're just taking a picture on your cell phone. One of these big factors of exposure is the ISO that you're using when you're shooting your image. ISO is the term that we use when we're referring to how light sensitive your film is. Now you can get all sorts of different types of film and each type of film has an ISO rating attached to it. Now, if you have a bit of a digital background, then you might know the term ISO already and how it relates to to the light sensitivity of your camera's digital sensor when you're taking your image. In the world of digital, you can change your ISO on the fly like that, just right in your camera. It's a built-in function when you're shooting. But for film, it's very different because ISO is one thing that you have to kind of determine really early on. In fact, ISO is one of the first things that you have to determine when you're gonna shoot a roll because you judge what you're gonna buy based on the ISO that you wanna shoot. The ISO of the film can also sometimes be referred to as the ASA or the rate of the film or the speed of the film. So the phrase box speed of your film refers to whatever ISO is actually on the box of film when you buy it or the canister if it doesn't come in a box. You buy Portra 400 ISO film, that means your box speed is 400 ISO. Now unlike digital, you can get film that has crazy low ISOs, which means that they have really, really fine grain and they need a lot of light to be able to get good exposures. Now you can use those films for really experimental things or to do really, really long exposures, even in broad daylight. You can also get films with ISOs of 50 and 100, and films like those are called low speed films. And they have very little grain, and they need a nice amount of light to be able to get good looking images. Now, as you increase the ISO, you get more grain in your image. And you can get films with ISOs of 200 and 400, and those are medium speed films. And they're a little more versatile, but they do have a medium amount of grain with them. And then you can get films that have ISOs like 8 or 3200 and those are what are called high speed films and they're much better for low light situations but they would definitely give you more pronounced grain than those low speed or even mid range films. So it's really important to understand that when we're shooting film the ISO of your film is not a camera function. It's a function of the film itself. It's baked into the film when it's manufactured and you can't change it in your camera unlike digital. Now most cameras have an ISO dial on them and this allows you to set the ISO of the film that you buy so that the internal light meter of your camera will be able to properly meter it to help you out determining exposure. So this dial is purely for you to be able to tell your camera what you are loading into it. So if you buy Portra 400 film, then you wanna set your dial to ISO 400 on your camera. If you set the ISO at a higher number, then the camera will think that it's more light sensitive than it is and you will be underexposing your film. So if we choose 800 instead of 400, it will be underexposed. And the opposite will happen if we choose a lower number on our ISO dial. The camera will think that your film is less light sensitive than it actually is, and then it will tell you to give the film more light than it needs. So if you buy 400 film and you set your ISO option on your camera at 100 or 50, then you're going to be overexposing your image. Now, when you're shooting film that is a negative, like color negative film and black and white negative film, then you can get away with overexposing or even underexposing your film just a little bit, because these kinds of films have a nice wide exposure latitude. So even if your exposure isn't perfect all the time, you can still get really good looking images out of these rolls. So you can always set your camera's ISO knob to maybe one half or one third lower than your actual ISO to just expose it a little bit more. Now, unlike negative film, color slide film needs a very precise exposure. So you never wanna go too far over or too far under when you're shooting these types of films. They just don't have a very good range to them. So you have to be really precise Precise. So make sure that you're setting that ISO knob to the proper number when you're shooting things like Provia or Valvia or Ektachrome. One of the ways that we measure light when we're taking an exposure in both digital and analog formats is by using a measurement called a stop. A stop of light is either doubling the amount of light you're letting in or having the amount of light that you're letting in. Now let's say you take an exposure that is perfect. Now let's say that you take that same exposure but overexpose it by one stop of light. That means that you're letting in twice the amount of light than you were from a normal exposure. So you're overexposing by one full stop. 
Now let's say that you take that same exposure and then underexpose it by one full stop. So that means that you're only letting in half of the amount of light than you were before. So you're underexposing by one full stop of light. We can see how ISO works with stops of light by either doubling our ISO or dividing our ISO in half. Let's say you start with an ISO of 400. If you want something that's going to be one stop brighter than 400, which would be double the amount of light sensitivity, then you would buy something that has an ISO of 800, which is double 400 ISO. If you want something that is one stop less light sensitive than 400, then you would buy an ISO of 200 instead, because that is only half as light sensitive as 400. You can also overexpose or underexpose your ISO of your film entirely by one stop by just rating it differently on your camera. So if you want to overexpose expose your 400 ISO by one full stop, then you would shoot it at 200 ISO because the camera thinks it needs more light than it actually does. And if you want to underexpose your 400 ISO by one full stop, then you would shoot it at 800. So every time you double your ISO rating, it is one stop more sensitive to light. 400 to 800, one stop brighter. 400 to 1600 ISO is doubling it twice. And because we're doubling it twice, that is two full stops more light sensitive. Now 400 down to 200 ISO means that you're losing one full stop of light, which means that it's half as light sensitive as 400 ISO. Now 400 ISO all the way down to 100 ISO, and because we've divided it twice from 400 down to 100, that means that you've lost two full stops of light. Now when you're deciding the ISO of the film that you're going to buy to take your pictures, you really have to think about what kind of lighting situations you'll be in when you're shooting those photos. So of course a lower ISO is great for really bright, sunny, outdoor situations, and a higher ISO is great for more indoor and darker situations. So ISO, aperture, and shutter speed are the three main things that you have direct control over when you're taking your picture. So in future videos, I'll be breaking down both shutter speed and aperture so that you can understand how they work separately as well. And then I'll be taking a look at how all these different factors work together in order to create perfect exposures when you're taking images on film. So I hope that this breakdown has helped you to understand a little bit about how ISO works in terms of analog formats and how it's different from when you're shooting on digital and ISO is just a menu option on your camera. Because now that you're shooting film, you have to think about ISO early on when you're in the camera store buying your film. Thank you guys so much for checking this video out and I hope that you really enjoyed it and you learned a little bit more about ISO and some of these basic exposure functions. If there are some questions or confusion surrounding any of these basic concepts about exposure, I will work in the future to continue to try and lessen that learning curve for some of you out there who just maybe don't have any sort of background or understanding or basis for some of this information. But I'm gonna try my absolute best to put some of this into terms that you guys out there can understand if you're struggling with it. So thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys soon.